I remembered learning about eating disorders in fifth grade, anorexia and bulimia. I remember thinking, that was crazy. Who would purposely starve themselves and cause so much harm? I remember thinking, that would never be me, because I just loved food too much. But now, that was me. From PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs and WETA Wellbeings, this is On Our Minds with Matt and Faiza, a podcast about teenagers and mental health, because life is hard and we're all going through something. And hearing stories about what other teens are going through and how they're getting better, it helps. A note before we get started, today we're going to talk about eating disorders. If you or someone you know needs help, we have a list of resources at studentreportinglabs.org slash mental health resources. If issues related to eating disorders like anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating are triggering topics, please share and listen with a trusted adult. How are you? Hi, Faiza. So it's currently in the morning right now. So I just had some oatmeal, which is kind of boring, but that was my breakfast today. But I think you've been fasting. Is that right? Yeah, I'm actually fasting for Ramadan this month since it goes from April to May. And I know this episode is coming out near June, but we're actually recording this in April. So hello from the past. So just to clarify, you eat after the sun goes down, right? But then nothing all day? Yeah, that's right. Um, We actually eat uh, during sunrise and then we don't eat until sunset. And a lot of people are like, not even water. But honestly, once you get to that point, you don't really notice it. But I have noticed that my mood can change throughout the day, like when I eat versus when I don't. I might be a little more irritable if I haven't eaten anything and then immediately feel better after a good meal. Eating or not eating can definitely affect our moods. Eating can actually do way more than affect our mood. In fact, sometimes our relationship with food can turn into a disorder. Our first story comes from Alice in Austin, Texas. She's going to be talking about her own journey of recovery from an eating disorder using the five stages of grief as a comparison model. The stories we shared in a previous episode about grief were from people who lost friends and family members. But you can grieve the loss of anything. In Alice's story, you'll hear acronyms such as BMI and ED, so we wanted to define them for you before we listen. BMI stands for body mass index and is often used to determine if a person has a healthy body weight for their height. ED stands for eating disorder. We want to clear up a few myths about eating disorders. The myths are that eating disorders are just about food or that it's a lifestyle choice. And those are just not true. Right. Eating disorders are actually serious illnesses that cause severe disturbances in people's eating behaviors, thoughts, and emotions. Eating disorders often require some combination of medical, psychiatric, therapeutic, and dietary intervention to achieve full recovery. Now, here's Alice describing her experience. I can't remember a time when I didn't hate how I looked. I've always looked different from my friends. I was a little chubby, my friends were skinny, like little twigs, and I wasn't, and it bothered me. It bothered me a lot. But the tipping point was when I went to the doctor to get a physical to clear me to be on my 7th grade track team. Other than a slightly high body mass index, or BMI, which I was well aware of, everything was fine. I was completely healthy. My doctor had other opinions. In the kindest words possible, he gave me one piece of advice before signing me off to run track. Just don't let it get any worse. I took those words to heart, and unfortunately, things did get worse. I began extreme restriction, eating and exercising daily in the pursuit of health, really the pursuit of thinness. I lost 40 pounds, but it was never enough. I continued to restrict. I weighed myself daily. If there was any change on the scale, any fluctuation, I would eat less and exercise more. I stopped getting my period. I got dizzy spells and heart flutters. I was afraid of food, afraid of social settings where I had to eat in front of others. I was not okay. Stage one, denial. When my mom told me she was putting me in therapy, I yelled at her. I hate you, you're making my life miserable on purpose. I told my mom she was making everything up because she felt guilty for being out of town on my birthday in early April and was pulling a stunt for attention. 
I said this to my own mother who has done nothing but care for me and has always had my best interest. But my brain was so twisted under the control of my eating disorder, I couldn't see straight. I said I was just eating healthy. I was just athletic. Never mind that my health was deteriorating by the day. My resting heart rate dropped into the 40s. I missed my period for a year and a half. No, it was normal, I said. Nothing to be concerned of at all. I spoke to my therapist about the logistics of eating disorder recovery. Here's what she had to say. There are a lot of individual things that happens with each person that goes on this journey. I will say that there are kind of things that are a little bit more common that we see. One is kind of the initial roadblock of seeing whether or not the person is kind of bought into that they have some sort of problem that needs to be worked on. Because you can't work on a problem that doesn't exist. And so that can be a very difficult barrier in the very beginning. It's just like getting on the same page about like, is there a problem? What is the problem? And what is the individual willing to change? There's very big limits on what you can make someone do. Stage two, anger. My anger was most directly focused on my mom. I blamed her for everything. If she hadn't emailed a therapist and a dietitian, if she hadn't started asking questions, if she hadn't started noticing, nothing would have happened. I would have gotten to stay as I was, to eat as little as I wanted, to exercise as much as I wanted. Of course, that's not true. Everything I was doing was unsustainable, but my brain wasn't my own. It was completely taken over by the eating disorder. I yelled at my parents, had fits every time I had to go to therapy, muttered under my breath at every meal that followed the meal plan. I poked at my food until it was cold before daring to eat what seemed like a feast, all the while staring daggers at my mom. I spoke to my mom about her experience during my eating disorder recovery process. Here's what she had to say. I think the love between a parent and a child is most keenly felt in those moments of pain and sorrow, in those moments when your child is struggling and you just sit with them to be present and be with them while they're having difficult feelings. Or maybe when your child is upset and angry at themselves, but they're trying to protect themselves from those feelings and they direct them toward you. You know, maybe, maybe that's love is letting your kid yell at you and say things that are upsetting and hurtful but that you take it because you know you can't make their pain go away, but you can take the anger they feel at themselves, and you can let them point it at you. It's not right, and it doesn't feel good, but I couldn't make Alice's pain go away, but I could be a target if she needed one so that she didn't have to hate herself. Stage three, bargaining. My therapist had been using eating disorder words and language, but never gave me a diagnosis. Being only five feet, my weight could go very low and my BMI would still be healthy, no matter the means of getting there. There was talk of OSFED, other specified feeding and eating disorder. My therapist had also said it was possible I just had food anxiety. I wanted to flip a table. Had I been going through months of eating disorder recovery only to learn that I just had food anxiety, I switched therapists. Around that time, I also saw a nurse practitioner who was an eating disorder specialist to look at my medical condition. I remember that first visit vividly. I didn't want to go. I was weighed, tested for orthostasis or low blood pressure, had blood taken and sent for a bone scan. I filled out forms for anxiety, depression, and eating disorder symptoms. When I finally met my nurse practitioner to discuss my behavior, I asked, So, what is this? She said, well, we can call it anorexia. There it was, the diagnosis. I wanted to cry. The truth just spilled out of me. I told her how sometimes I'd been throwing out my food when my mom wasn't with me and not following the meal plan. I told her how I was excessively exercising every day and would lose it if I had a day where I couldn't. So then came the restrictions. No more than 30 minutes of exercise a day, six days a week. I later learned that this was generous. Strictly following an exchange meal plan, one serving of protein, two to three carbs, two to three fats, and three meals a day and three snacks a day. I had to log every meal on a recovery record, an app that my dietitian could monitor. My mom had to check every meal I made for myself. And with the new rules came the bargaining. If the exercise is really low impact, like walking, can I do 45 minutes? What if I have an extra fat at dinner to make up for lunch? The answer was almost always no. But I kept trying. 
What if I have just one day where I exercise more? My dance class wasn't that strenuous. Can I still do a workout? It started to fizzle out eventually, but it lasted a while. I eventually started to realize that change wouldn't come until I ate more, exercised less, and gained weight. Three of the hardest possible things for me to do. Stage four, depression. I ate more, I exercised less, I gained weight. I gained a lot of weight. And even though that was the point, even though it was a good thing, it felt terrible. It felt miserable. Every day I'd look in the mirror hating myself more and more. Every week when my dietitian took a blind weight, I could almost feel the numbers ticking up higher and higher. I felt like it would never stop. I lost confidence. My ability to be around friends deteriorated. I had no motivation for school, hobbies, or anything. I cried almost every night. I was put on antidepressants and later upped the dosage. When I finally reached my target weight, I still hadn't gotten a period and mentally felt worse than ever. My exercise restrictions were lifted and I had freedom in my meal plan, but I had no desire to exercise or eat healthy or cook. I lost interest in the things that had defined me. I no longer wanted to ride my bike, go for runs or plan workouts. I was struggling to hold on to who I was. I didn't recognize myself and nothing helped. All the while receiving the message from my therapist, dietitian, and nurse practitioner that I was doing great and that I should just be okay with how I looked. And I didn't, and I still don't. Stage five, acceptance. If I'm being completely honest, I don't know if I'm here yet. I'm doing much better than I was. My enjoyment of life has increased considerably. I've started to do things I love again and not only health related things. But I still don't like how I look, and I still struggle to eat bigger meals. But I am seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I can tell that although I might not be reaching acceptance, I'm at least reaching neutrality. I know things won't get better immediately, and honestly, things will probably get hard again, and then better, and then really good, and then bad again. Because recovery is not linear. But I do know that I've made it through some of the hardest times, and I don't want this cycle to repeat endlessly. I don't want to wake up 10 years from now and still be afraid of food. I don't want to wake up 10 years from now and still be torturing my body. And that, I know for sure. With us here to help us process Alice's story and better understand eating disorders is Dr. Lisa Damore, and we want to say thank you so much for joining us. Really glad to be with you. The story we just heard from Alice is super powerful. Did anything about her experience surprise you, or is it similar to what a lot of people who have eating disorders experience? There was a lot in that story that really describes often how eating disorders unfold. I will say the piece that surprised me is that it sounded like she lost a lot of weight fast, and the question of whether or not she had an eating disorder or what her diagnosis was seemed like it took longer to sort out than it should have. We were also wondering if anyone listening feels like that maybe they're overthinking or controlling their eating, what suggestions would you have for them on steps that they should be taking? Well, the first thing I would want anyone who is starting to have a complex relationship with food to know is that they should take that very seriously right away. And one of the basic reasons for that is you have to have a relationship with food for the rest of your life. And if you get yourself into a situation where you treat food as an enemy, and then you have to get back on good terms with that enemy and stay on that good terms with that enemy for a long time, that's a lot of work. And so one of the most important things to know about eating and eating disorders is that you don't want to go very far down that road. If you are flirting with it, get help early, get help often. The further you go down that road, the harder it is to come back. And so I was so sad in listening to Alice's story to hear how far down that road she got before she really got the help she deserved. So that's one thing. The other thing I would want listeners to really pay attention to is what their body's asking for. We have cues that tell us when to eat hunger. We have cues that let us know when it's time to slow down, feeling really satiated. Um, most of the time, not for everybody all the time, but most of the time, those cues are really important. And so if you're hungry, eat. <laughs> That's what I would say. 
And what about if we notice a friend who is losing a lot of weight or developing unhealthy eating habits such as talking negatively about food? What do you recommend? Well, I will tell you, by the time someone, especially a teenager, is losing a lot of weight, an eating disorder is almost always well underway. Teenagers should actually be gaining weight, gaining strength. And so visible weight loss means that they are further down that road than we would have ever wanted anyone to get. I would put eating disorders in a category with every other, all of the other really dangerous things teenagers can do. Um, and in fact, anorexia nervosa is the most lethal psychiatric disorder. Um, one in 10 people who suffer from anorexia die from it. So we don't trifle with eating disorders. So if you have a friend who is not taking good care of themselves, not in a good relationship with food, you need to do one of two things. You either need to say to them, I really care about you and I am worried about your relationship with food or weight or exercise and we need to let an adult know. If the friend says, great, then you go do that. If the friend says, you're just jealous because I'm losing weight or you don't really get it or any other thing, then the other thing you need to do is say, all right, I know you might be mad at me, but I care more about your health and safety than I do about us getting along. I'm going to let an adult know. And if you feel like you can't say something to the friend and sometimes you can't, then you just need to let the adult know. But somehow, one way or another, an adult who can be trusted and can do helpful things needs to be alerted to the eating disorder. This is as dangerous as anything teenagers do. So you mentioned a lot about how like, when we notice a friend who is developing these unhealthy habits that it's great to bring up like a trusted, uh, a trusted figure. So for people who are that trusted figure is a parent. We were wondering like, what should parents know about eating disorders in teenagers? What they should know is that they are most likely to occur in adolescence in terms of when we see over the lifespan, the likelihood of eating disorders occur. Adolescence is a prime time. What they should also know is eating disorders are not just white girls, that we see eating disorder in kids of all color, kids of all gender, um, and so I think sometimes people dismiss eating disorders, especially in boys, where we have seen a real rise in eating disorders that often take the form of being um, very, very obsessional about being fit or cut. That can easily be missed. And what I would say is you want to get help right away. Um, when we look at the prognosis for an eating disorder, the likelihood of recovery, the speed with which care is provided is a major factor. And so um, we have gotten much better at treating eating disorders over the last few decades. I would right away talk with a medical health professional. I would right away get that child treatment. Um, even if it doesn't seem like a big deal, you don't want it to turn into a big deal. Thank you so much for joining us today and helping us understand eating disorders even further. If you or someone you know is struggling with an eating disorder, the National Eating Disorders Association is here to help. If you are in a crisis, you can text NEDA to 741741 to be connected with a trained volunteer. Alice also had the opportunity to talk to British YouTuber and social media influencer Ro Mitchell about her experience with anorexia and how social media can go either way sometimes toxic, and sometimes lead to recovery. What we hear next is part of their conversation. Hi, I'm Alice. It's so nice to meet you. Hi, lovely to meet you. What influence do you think social media has on teens specifically regarding body image and health? I think it has good influence, but also incredibly toxic influence because obviously you've got diet culture and along with like Instagram and all the edited and posed pictures and people always promoting like this is the perfect body and then they get respect and love on their posts for looking like this ideal perfect person and it's just not realistic which then obviously makes everyone else feel worse about themselves so it can be really good in the sense that people can spread good messages but there's definitely a very big downside to it. I know we live in a very like diet culture focused world how do you kind of combat that in your social media platforms? I even now am influenced by seeing <clears throat> people in sort of smaller bodies online and fashion and how that's so like centered around smaller bodies. Um, but I, 
I kind of tell myself that actually that's not how my body is meant to be. And if I want to eat in a way that's going to make me happy and move my body in a way that's going to make me happy, I can't at the same time be striving to be that perfect, like society's idea of perfect body. What would your advice be to someone who's struggling to committing to recovery? That you need to do it to live and that the longer you put it off, the harder it's going to get. And you're, it's, it's never going to feel like the right time to start recovery. You're never going to get to a place where you think, oh, actually, I've struggled enough now. Like this, this is time. Like you're going to get to a place where you get so fed up of doing it that then you need to recover. Like there's no, you can't wait. It's the kind of, if not now, then when idea. Um, because I know that if I hadn't started when I'd started, I would never have done it. So as soon as you recognize that there's a problem, and you feel any level of strength to be able to combat it, go for it. To anybody who's suffering, like you are strong and you are capable of recovery. And if anyone tells you that you're not going to recover, I was told that and look where I am. Like you will be okay. If you put the work in, you'll get the rewards and everything will be fine. Thank you so much to Rowan Alice for that eye-opening conversation. Sharing your recovery journey using TikTok, Instagram, or YouTube must take a lot of courage. You can watch some of Rose's videos on youtube.com slash Mitchell, and that's Mitchell with two L's. If this episode has helped you in any way, please consider giving us a review as it would really help spread the word about the podcast. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to get notifications for upcoming episodes. In the next episode, we're going to hear from teens about identifying as LGBTQ and the challenges that can result when they're not fully accepted or represented. Well, stay tuned. And thanks again for listening. Today's story was produced by Alice from Austin, Texas. This episode was produced and edited by Student Reporting Lab's digital producer, Rowan Albaba, with help from Bridget Gansky and Jayla Moore-Ross. Executive producer, Leah Clapman, and help from the rest of the Student Reporting Lab staff and music by Blue Dot Sessions. Also, thank you to Dr. Lisa Damore for speaking with us. Once again, if you or someone you know needs help, we have a list of resources at studentreportinglabs.org slash mental health resources. And tell your friends about us. Spread the word. The more people who know about mental health, the better. <laughs>